to this week's Let's Talk Aging. My name is Molly Wisniewski of The Upside to Aging, and today I'm speaking with Gary Joseph LeBlanc, author, speaker, and dementia care specialist at Common Sense Caregiving. So Gary, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, uh, I, I think we're going to have a great conversation. You, uh, your background in dementia care and your angel dementia care training program are really um, just critical in this time in the aging services. So uh, before we jump in, can you tell us a little bit about what you do and what services you provide in the aging services? Okay. Um, I'm a certified dementia communication specialist. Uh, I've been a weekly columnist. I've been writing a column for, it'll be 10 years August 1st. So uh, throughout the newspapers in the country, I probably got over 450 articles in newsprint just on dementia care. Yeah. On it. Um, four books on dementia care, but honestly, all of my experience came out of 20 years with my, both of my parents. Mm -hmm. I took care of my dad for 12 years. He died of Alzheimer's, and about six months after my dad, I was like, okay, now we can't leave mom alone. She died of vascular dementia. Yeah. So I got to see both of those diseases from day one to day zero. I mean, the end day on it. So it was quite the lesson on it. Uh, I will say 20 years ago, I was struggling. There was no information on this. I mean, not like today. It's one of the reasons why I'm so adamant about there educating people on it today because I know what I was struggling with where you just couldn't find anything on it. Yeah. And we had one support group. I live in Florida, a uh, little town, Brooksville, north of me. And back then, there was one support group once a month. If you missed that month, you had to wait a whole other month. I know, you know now they're on every corner, right. all different times of day. I mean, we've come a long ways on that aspect. So. Yeah, we definitely have. I, I agree. Um, there's so many resources out there, and, and the internet helps too, right? Yeah. Um, there was no Facebook back then. No. <laughs> I mean, all that stuff didn't exist, you know? I mean, so. No, yeah. So um, you mentioned that that was a bit of a motivator for you to stay in the field. All right. Yeah. Um, well, I'll be straight out. When my dad died, I learned a hard lesson on this that once a caregiver, always a caregiver. Mm -hmm. I truly didn't know what to do with myself. After a 12 year run with him, seven days a week, you know, it was 24 seven on it. He, I, felt I was in a void. Yeah. I mean, the cat's sneezing and I'm running across the room trying to heal the cat with a handkerchief, you know, I'm like, oh my God, the cat's like, I got somebody to take care of, you know? <laughs> it's just a deal in it. So, I mean, you, you find out, and all of a sudden I'm going to more support groups then than I was at first because I'm looking, I was going to support groups to help the others. Mm, and yeah. you almost you get a fix off of it like a junkie. I hate to say it like that, but it's kind of true. So not that I was happy when mom got sick, but all of a sudden it gave me my second purpose again. And the second round went a lot smoother because I made so many mistakes that I learned from on yeah. the first round. Yeah. Learn. Learn from your mistakes. I mean, that's yeah. – because we're all going to make them. I mean, yeah. there's no question. Especially in dementia care. I mean, there's no – every person's individ an individual. Every approach has to be unique. And it, it does become trial and error. I think some people – are scared of that. Um, they're scared that they're going to mess up in some way. And uh, as long as your heart's there and the intent is there, I think. Um, there's, there's a lot of responsibilities involved, so there's a lot of pressures on their shoulders. Us how yeah. you, um, yeah. moved into dementia care training, but then also created your own training process. Yeah. Um, um, honestly, it probably started out with hospital stays with uh, watching these people don't have no clue how to handle these people with dementia in the hospital. Yeah. And I was shocked. I mean, it was, it was extreme yeah. on this deal. And I mean, you guys just don't get this on so something. Maybe it's just this one hospital. And I'm like, all right. So, so I started writing some articles on this and I was bombarded with response. And not only just the United States, I mean, all international, this is a global problem. With this yeah. Yeah. So I, eight years ago, maybe nine now, I started the Alzheimer's hospital risk band program on that so we're putting the purple angel symbol on the band in the hospital setting that's oh. only an at-risk logo it's just a symbol of the purple angel on it um stating that this patient is at risk for cognitive impairment no hip violations it's not a diagnosis it's not a, you know you're not naming a disease it's just an at-risk symbol on it mm -hmm. but you can't just put this on their risk band. you have to bring the education to the hospital yeah so what i'm doing now is i'm training the trainers i've gone out when i first started i was training the hospital well, that could take two weeks to train one hospital yeah. Very, you got to do, you know, you got to do maybe 15, 20 employees at a time. I mean, it's tough. You can't pull everybody off the floor. He's taught a lot of little classes. It takes a long time. So I figured out training the trainers is the best route. Uh, I think we're going on to our 16th hospital now that we've got trained. 
So it's Absolutely. been a good thing. We just finished Lowell, Massachusetts, General. Uh, I just came on board. I'm working with one in uh, Cedar Rapid, Iowa right now. Mm -hmm. so it took a lot of work, a lot of time. It's very corporate. Right. Uh, I mean, very, very corporate. When you think you're talking to the top guy, there's another hundred people above him. I mean, <laughs> Yeah. Um, are you finding that there's an increase in interest? Um, are they coming to you? Or are they're they coming to me and it's coming out of family complaints and it's coming out of lawsuits, to be honest. Yeah. And the fact that right now, the way the laws have been changed with the uh, Affordable Care Act, they're getting fined for early readmissions. Yes. Right. So they're handing these people with dementia. They're discharging them. Here's your rehab papers. Go home, follow the instructions and see your specialist. They're right back in their laps two weeks later. Yeah. The caregivers are a mess. If they think that you put them in the hospital, it gives the caregiver a two week break. That's not the case. Mm -hmm. Now the caregivers are so stressed out that the loved ones in the hospital, nobody's taking care of them right. Everything is melting down on them. Right? So, yeah. so that's one of the reasons they're getting a lot of contacts on it. And the family complaints of this, they're seeing more and more cases of it. I mean, the hospitals are full of dementia, but they're not there for Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. They go there because they might have Alzheimer's and some type of infection or virus or something on top of that. Well, you're going to see that patient at its worst. Yeah. You know, look what happens with a UTI. Oh, my goodness. You're a track infection these people. And it's not only just the Alzheimer's dementia that they're facing, if it's Louis Bois or whatever it is, it's to that. Now the infection's on top of that, and now they're a complete mess. Yeah. Well, and then on top of that, the, the blanket use of dementia um, in response to things like a UTI. So somebody, you know, obtains a UTI and then they're starting to demonstrate symptoms of dementia and all of a sudden they're labeled and they, they're yes. sick. We have a major problem here in Florida with that. We have what we call the Baker Act, which is basically it might be a 5150 in your state or other states on it. It's a 72-hour psych evaluation. Mm -hmm. We have more people with dementia being Baker Acted just because of a UTI. Yeah, they don't yeah. belong in behavior health. They belong on the right antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Yes. And once they get stuck in that behavior health, they get labeled, they get re-diagnosed, and then they don't even go back to the assisted living, then they just get pulled out of. Yes. Now they yes. won't take them back. Right. That's a whole other problem. I could go an hour on that one, man. <laughs> let me tell you. It's very yeah. upsetting to me on this one. I, I, I completely agree. I think it's so, um, but it, it, it really stems from a misunderstanding of the symptoms. Or it comes out of a babysitting tool. Yeah. They, they're just moving them out of their facilities because they don't want to deal with their behaviors. Well, all they really need is the antibox to control their behaviors and get them right back to normal. Exactly. And half the time, they're not even giving them the right antibox. If that UTI keeps coming back and coming back and coming back, you need to start doing a culture right. and find out whether you're giving them the right antibiotics. And half the time, they don't even go that route. Yeah. They just well, keep giving them the same Z-Pack. Yeah. And, and use other methods. So I, I've seen several reports of, because hospitals don't have the same regulations as nursing homes, as you know. Um, so using constraints, physical constraints are, are allowed in hospitals. Physically and medically. Right. So, um, and not to say that they don't happen in nursing homes either. They do, but at, at least there's much more awareness that these types of approaches are unacceptable. This is what we, I spent all day yesterday training a facility just north of me, a brand new building called the Royal Dalton House on it. And we're talking about this is a deal. You need to learn how to use redirection the proper way. Yeah, yeah. Ice cream, best redirection tool in the world. Yeah. They shouldn't be running to the medicine cart, they should be running to the freezer. Yes. Because yeah. one little bowl of ice cream, also they got a little piece, man. You hear that spoon hit the bottom, you run and get another one, man. I mean, it's just, you know. It's exactly. But they're not thinking of no, no. So this is one of the things I've worked really hard on getting them straight on that. I hate it when they see them over medicated. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a time and place for it at times, mm -hmm. right? But that should be the last resort. Yeah, definitely. No, I, I completely agree. Um, so just to clarify, you are in the hospital setting, but you're also in the um, nursing home setting as well. Uh, pretty much all over in this yeah. field on it. Uh, home care, um, okay. hospitals, you know, a lot of a lot of facilities, a lot of memory care units, a lot of assisted living, independent living, you know, not a lot of them are all, all three are one building right now. Yeah. Seen yeah, a lot of that. Yeah. Um, but um, the people that you're training, you said you're training the trainers. How are they um, responding to this education? Very um, good. Yeah. They right. are. If I do a hospital, I'm like, give me at least five of your trainers. Right. Bring me a team of your trainers. You can't just train one person. Mm -hmm. You can't just train two because I'm going to tell you, in six months, they might not even be working in that building. You might be working in this building now. Yeah. Right. So you got to get, get a group of people in this. And it, and it takes two, three people to train a whole hospital building because you got to do so many classes. You're going to wear one person down on it. I mean, I, I spoke five hours yesterday. I barely have a voice today on it. I mean, it's, I mean, it's 
So, you know, you got to spread it out a little bit on it. And the more people you educate, the better on it. And even if the fact that that trainer now does go work in another building, now your training's over there. Yeah. At least they're moving it with them on it. You know, I mean, it's not good for the corporation maybe, but it's good for the next corporation on it. Right. Right. Well, and then, and then the person. Good for the residents and the, yeah, and the exactly. patients. Right? So. Exactly. Yeah. I, um, now when I'm going into the system livings and the memory care, I'm training right on the staff. That's staff right there. And I don't bother with the trainers and I am the trainer for that on it. Yeah. The hospital's a different setting. I mean, some of these hospitals, they might have 2000 employees or more. Yeah. So you need and I want to see everybody trained. I want the volunteers. I want to see dietitians. I mean, all the stuff should be trained because they're all going to run into these people at the same time. Mm -hmm. One problem I do run into is a lot of the hospitals we go to train, the emergency room, which is very important, right? Yeah. Is owned by a sub company. Oh, yeah. We get to train the whole hospital, but we don't get to train the emergency room because it's a different company that's owned the subleasing the basin. They subbed out the emergency room on it. Right. And and that's that has been a little bit of a problem. There's not a lot we can do about it. We try to get the sub company to come in, but sometimes they agree, sometimes they don't. Right. And that's where, I mean, that's where they're going. <laughs> uh, right. right into the ER. ICUs, a lot of ICUs are subbed out. I'm not worried about them in the ICU because they're basically getting one on one care. Mm -hmm. up there i mean that's i wish it was like that in the rest of the building but it's not yeah yeah um I, i'm so encouraged to hear that because i i remember oh well dementia care especially in a nursing home or a long-term care unit you're getting an hour once a year and it's typically online uh you go through <laughs> the course and then you take a quiz afterwards and yeah. If you don't pass, you get to take it again. Yeah, if you don't pass. But I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody talking while they're taking the quiz. Or um, actually, I was sitting in a one, it was a group, um, and the person that was leading it said, I know this is boring, but we have to do it. And the attitudes um, I have found over the years have been not as... Um, enthusiastic as I, I think I would hope that they are. So it was really encouraging to hear that you are on the floor, that you are there and you are. And I'm very, I work the room. I mean, I mean, it was, it's not boring, man. We keep their, I keep their attention the whole time through it on it. Because I put myself in life, life situations on it. Yeah. On it. I keep myself on their level. I mean, right. it's, you know, on it. So, well, you know, you get them involved, do a little role playing, you get them well moved. So the training is actually, they're having fun. Yeah, I love that. Um, I and you know, just coming back and then two weeks, two weeks later after I just left, they go, you know, the staff's still talking about the training you just did. Oh, so to me, I'm like, okay, well, they retained it for three weeks. <laughs> you yeah. know, that's right. Let's start, yeah. right? They're well, retaining it. That's the point, you know. So. And for CNAs and GNAs especially, because <clears throat> they become the direct care providers, they're they're on the front line. I, I think a lot of times, and I'm going to ask you what types of interventions you mentioned the ice cream um but you're providing them with tools desperate, right. like tools that they Cuts. are desperately needing but just by putting something in their hand in the hospital training right we're telling the rns and they're on it if mr jones is giving you this really hard time go get a whole bunch of white towels unfold them and go mr jones i am so busy i can't even get to my next patient can you help me right and he's like yeah now you got me doing woman's work but you know what <laughs> at the same time he's got it in his hands and he's calming himself down yeah. and at half, half time that's all he takes yeah. Now he feels like he's doing something helpful. Exactly. It, got it in his hands and it's calming him down. His other thoughts are going away on it. You got to learn to redirection first. Yes. If it I doesn't think. work, then we take a different route. Mm -hmm. so. No, I love that. Um, I my background is in activities, so we didn't have medical tools, and you very quickly had to learn how to use redirection and and understand what the right redirection is for each person. Um, it's extremely important, but not only is it important, you are are giving them purpose, a sense of self, and you are quite literally changing their entire day around and potentially the staff that they interact with as well. Um, I tell all the activity directors that they are the unsung heroes of that building. Yeah. They don't get the credit they deserve. And half the time they're doing everybody else's job. Everybody's yeah. trying to get them to help them out and do the thing on it. When their job is extremely important. Yeah. Because we have to keep these people social as long as we can. Mm -hmm. That's the one best thing we have to keep their symptoms as may has been keeping them social. It's a little routine and socialism. We gotta find that combination of it. Yeah. On it. But there's activity without the activity directors, these people are gonna sit there and rot. I'm sorry. 
No, it's true. I mean, so you got to keep them active and you got to do it right. And you have to follow every, you might have 15, 20 Mr. Jones in your memory care unit. You're the activity director, but you have to find out and realize how each one of them is dissolving or, right. you know, advancing in the diseases. So this Mr. Jones might be able to sit at that table and do a jigsaw puzzle, let's say, for 20 minutes. Well, this Mr. Jones is only good for 40 minutes. Yep. If you leave them both at that table for an hour, this one's got 40 minutes to get in trouble. This one's got 20 minutes to get in trouble. Yeah. So you have to learn every single patient, every resident. It's true. Stay on it, on it. So it, it's not easy. It's People think this is an easy job. I yeah. know it's not. Um, but can you tell us a little bit more about what um, types of interventions that you are teaching in your courses? Okay. Uh, I like them so, so I like them out of the building, mm -hmm. if you can. I mean, at the earlier stages of dealing with it. Yeah. So even like uh, yesterday, I'm like, who's driving the bus? You got a bus out front, it has your name on it. Bring that bus driver in let's get to the training. Yes. Right? So he's got these people on that, but he needs to learn all this stuff too, for example, on it, all right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, I don't want him like, say if you wanted to take him to a restaurant, let's not go to a new restaurant every week because now you're throwing out the routine. But yeah. let's bring him to that same cafe. Yeah. Where the staff knows him, you know, and all this stuff. And we get him used to and They can sit at the same table even. Yeah, if they can on it, so it keeps them calm dealing on it. Socialism is very important on dealing on it. Uh, a lot of stuff we're teaching about, like I said, redirecting touch, taste, smell, and, and most of these field things you can't do aromatherapy on it. A music therapy, huge though. Yeah, sundowning, yes. huge on music therapy on this. Mm -hmm. Louis body, hallucination. I'm huge on music therapy. Yeah, I had a guy call me the other day. Right, he said, Gary, I'm a mess. I don't know what to do. I'm driving on the East Coast, right? And he called me, I'm just getting my drive. I got a two and a half hour drive. I was like, you got a set of headphones? He's like, yeah, I go, find some music you like, just sit in your favorite chair and put them on. By the time I got to the other coast, two and a half hour drive, he called me back, he goes, thank you. Oh, yeah. Because it just brought him back to where he needed to be. Yeah. This man, I could tell on the phone, this guy was a mess. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. You could see, the, just from his voice, you could hear all the anxiety and everything building in this man. You know, yeah. Well, music therapy is good. You got to find what music they like. You don't want to put something on they don't like. Mm -hmm. Here's the other thing I'm telling all the residents, all the staff members. When the families are there visiting, you need to start asking questions. Yeah. You need to get the history of this person. Mm -hmm. If Mr. Jones is a lieutenant in the Navy, you could use this. Yeah. He starts getting a little combative, a little behavior problems. Like, hey, straighten up, lieutenant. He's like, oh, I'm in trouble again. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know. <laughs> but if you don't know that piece of history, you're never going to be able to use it. Mm -hmm. And even when it comes down to bathing, Right? You're giving them a hard time. You're all going to have problems bathing on it, but they need to know the history of this man. Yeah. Did he, does Mr. Jones like to shave before or after the shower? Mm -hmm. I always shave after. So if I, you put me in a facility, you're trying to make me shave first, you just turned everything up upside down before we even got started. Right. That's true. So all these little questions, simple stuff, but you got to get this information out of the families, whoever that person's yeah, advocate. Really Usually when you get behaviors and all that, it's almost always something environmental. Mm -hmm. But everybody just wants to blame it on the disease. Yes. They also, I go, no, it's, it's, the disease might just be a piece of this. There's something in this environment that's causing it. We, we can figure this stuff out if we try. Yeah, exactly. But, I mean, it could be too much, too much commotion. Oh, here was, just I told the staff yesterday, oh, the Halloween party. I know you guys all want to dress up, man, but put yourself in their shoes. All of a sudden, everybody's in costume. You got this big party going on, and this is way too much for Mr. Jones. Yeah. But I said, you got to get him back in his routine. And routine does not mean to put the man back in his bedroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you walk in these buildings, you always see somebody sitting in that one chair in the front lobby every time you walk in. Yep. That's that person's routine. Yeah. There's a reason they're always sitting in that chair. It's a safety zone to them. Yeah. When you try to force them back in their room, the anxiety's only going to build back there. The behavior's not going to go away. They're going to get worse. Exactly. You have to learn what that routine is for that person and what environment you think is going to come down the, the map. Yeah. Definitely. Unfortunately, a lot of these buildings, they don't want to see somebody upset in their lobby because here comes the, the, a new a new client, maybe, with their family coming to look out at the facility. And yeah. But, yeah. Um, it's like the marketing directors. They tell everybody in the buildings, I want everybody to look busy. I got a tour coming around at 1 o'clock. Yes. Well, Mr. Jones might not want to be busy at that moment. Right. And they're trying to force this man to look busy, and all of a sudden they get, and it makes it worse, right? There's ways that we can really make these people have a good quality of life if we just learn. Yeah. And it's all and it's all education. We got we got to learn as much as we can about this. So. Yeah, well, we're learning more and more. I mean, we're really and it's a lot of where the reason why we're learning is because now we're actually hearing from the people living with these diseases. Yes. Before nobody wanted to listen to them, they have all the information. Mm -hmm. We just got to get it out of them, right? Before it's right. too late. In most cases, on this, on it. they are the experts. They're living with it. 
It surely it's true. probably is harder on the person caring for them sometimes. If mm -hmm. the family member that caring for them on it is they're, they're just stressed out, they're depressed. You know, I mean, and that's the other thing we don't have to worry about. The depression man can cause dementia by itself. So we need to make sure these people with, the, with these diseases stay out of the bouts of depression. They're all going to have it eventually. You know, they're all going to go through bouts of depression, but we have to address this stuff on it. But I can't tell you how many caregivers come up to me and they go, Gary, is Alzheimer's contagious? Because now I think I have it. And it's like, you know what that's happening to them? They're getting dementia coming out of the de caregiving depression. Yeah. That they're stuck in on this deal on it. And it's feeling like they have Alzheimer's deal. On it, so. Yeah. So a lot of the see we always hear the venting. You go on Facebook, you go in these uh, groups, all these dementia groups, and it gets pretty dark. Yeah. The caregivers, but you got to vent somewhere for the caregivers. On it, but I mean, the, a lot of the stigmas are coming out of the venting. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I think I think you raise a great point because, um, and I'll speak more for the family caregivers than the professional caregivers because. While I think professional caregivers need much more education and training and tools, and they're looking for that, the family caregivers are have a kind of two things happening at the same time. So they're, they're becoming caregivers, but they're becoming caregivers to individuals who others in their support network don't understand what's going on. So they have no person in their support to go to, to, um, to express, you know, what's happening to them. Um, so they kind of hide it. They, they, you know, they, they make up for what's happening to their loved one, um, which completely, I mean, without support, you are, you're going to get stressed. You're going to get uh, burnout. You're going to continue this habit of, of hiding them. Um, when it, if they know and if they understand, um, there's a lot of light that can come out of that and they can come out of hiding. The best thing they can get out of going to support groups, that's why I stress to all of them they need to go into support group, is because they're going to find out what's available locally. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of help out there now. It's not like it was 20 years ago or more far longer than that. We actually have stuff that's assisting on it. I mean, adult daycare programs, stuff like that, to help you get a little bit of respite. Catholic Charities here, for example, down here in Florida. They got a program right up the road. They got two of them, one county, this county, that I know of right here on it, $20 a day. Wow. They get grant money through United Way. It's from 11 to like 4, and they'll take only for people with dementia. They got adult daycare for like four or five hours a day. Wow. For $20. And wow. I've trained the staff. I've trained all the volunteers. Over there. I know they're doing a good job caring for these people. Yeah, that's great. But where are you going to find that? But if you don't know it's available, I mean, it's just – you know, so there is stuff out there. Now, some of these adult daycares, they're 70 to $100 a day. Mm -hmm. This one here, I mean, is pretty cheap, and, and they're doing a good job over there. So, Yeah, and that respite. But that's the stuff you learn. You got to learn what's available local. You might not be getting help from the right doctor. You may find out, hey, this doctor did really good. So there's information there that's going to help all the caregivers on it. Yeah. Um, what have you found in your trainings, or just in, in speaking with um, – individuals, whether they be professionals or family caregivers, um, are some of the biggest misconceptions about dementia? That they don't have a quality of life. Um, yeah, I guess then you have to find, exercise is one of the main things we need to keep them going, keep people moving on this, but socialism is the other. Yeah. And this is one of the mistakes I made in the beginning because nobody was telling me anything different on this on it with my dad. I'm, I was keeping them home to keep them safe. Right. I was excavating everything because I was overprotecting it. Mm -hmm. We got to get them out in public. Yeah. We're not, we're not talking about going to the big Walmarts or the Costco's or stuff like that. All oh, these super stores on the other, but the Dollar Generals, the mom and pop brick and mortar stores, yeah. we can still get them out and go have a good afternoon. And it's good for the caregiver. You're out of the house too. On it. Uh, one of the things is, you know, they, they are fine in public. And that's why all these people that are working on dementia friendly communities, this is important stuff. Yeah. But we can get these people to go to these stores that are dementia friendly and stuff like that on it. But, um, got a long ways to go on that, but we're getting there on it. Um, really, I mean, it's good for both people on it. I used to take my dad and just take him for a ride. Yeah. That didn't work out well. He would get, he'd get antsy, the anxiety would build him in the car. You don't, you're going down the wrong road. You don't know where you're going. I mean, all this on it. So, I mean, but I had waited too late. I mean, by the time I'm trying to pull this stuff off, you know, 
You can do a lot of damage if you don't do it right from the beginning. Um, the best thing you can do is learn right from the start. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, the honest truth, the best thing you can do is they learn before. Nobody wants to learn about this stuff until it falls in your lap. Right. And it's actually true of that for any disease. Yeah. You don't want to worry, learn about lung cancer unless also you have it or your, your, your brother has it or some family member has it. That's just the way with dementia. But. It's true. Um, I'm always saying I, they put so much stock into planning for retirement um, that I think the conversation stops there a lot of times where, um, you know, our, our goal is always to achieve retirement, but nobody tells you what to do after that. And it's what happens after that is some of the um, biggest struggles that a lot of people will go to or, or the biggest changes that somebody will go through. Um, we don't even think about long-term care and then so boy i wish i would have done that too i mean all this stuff you're thinking about this stuff on it but yeah i can't these diseases are extremely expensive in the end i mean uh, they, they're they're going to they're going to drain your bank account on it that, that's all there is to it on it yeah. uh, the most caregivers are going to have to quit their job or cut their job in half mm -hmm. on it so you take care of your loved one for five six years now you didn't work for five six years you have a really hard time getting back into the workforce yeah i'm telling all the all these we'll go go volunteer at least get that on your resume. I just volunteered at United Way. I did a three-month project with them. I'm still worth something, you know. And right. you go and you start handing out resumes, and you have no job for the last five years, you're, yeah. you're going to the bottom of the pile. Yeah. Well, especially, too, we're seeing right women becoming um, increasingly uh, the caregivers, but they're being it, – it's happening at, at younger ages. So women are, are – either just becoming mothers or or maybe they have older children but they've left the the, 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 sand, the sandwich generation yeah so you're still caring for your own kids and also you're caring for your parents at the same time right right so yeah it's definitely that's, that's a good piece of advice though to volunteer a while right you had to get yourself back and you know like i said when my dad died i was lost yeah you don't want to stay on the couch bummed out i mean you can grieve you know Nobody's going to tell you how long you should grieve, but you don't have to grieve at home. Right. You right. can go grieve at the beach if you want. You just <laughs> can't get to get that right state of mind going, you know, on it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I, I like that. I think that's a good, um, that's a good piece of advice for, for caregivers, especially because caregiving is such a uh, thankless job, um, particularly the, primary caregiver who kind of assumes these roles, um, whether it's convenience or whether they're the, just the ones that have stepped up, um, a lot of people in their circle won't engage. They'll help, but they don't know how to help. So afterwards, after you know maybe their family member passed away, I think that there's an opportunity there to kind of raise this, um, this population up because there are so many of them um, and, and give them purpose again. And whether that be getting back into the field of aging, like you have, I mean, your path, because you had this experience, you are now teaching thousands of people <laughs> on, you know, dementia. You gotta get some good coming out of the bad, man, on it, you know? Yeah. You know, but, the, the problem I have, I, the biggest complaint I should say that I have, no matter what part of the country I'm in, Mm -hmm. I am the only family member doing anything. None of my siblings will help. Mm -hmm. Number one complaint I get from caregivers. And they're mad. And they should be mad. Yeah. Because sometimes if they don't get mad, they're not going to say anything to their siblings. They're not doing it. So the sibling calls up mom. He's talking to mom on the phone. He puts the Susie on the phone who's taking care of her. He gets off and he goes, Susie's doing great. Man, I talked to mom. Mom's doing good. Susie's losing big patches of hair out of the back of her head. Mom doesn't even know who she just talked to. Yeah. Video conferences like this. It's the way the family should be communicating with the caregivers and their loved ones. Because right. then you've actually physically, it's going to help, first of all, it's going to help the person with dementia have an idea of who they're talking to. They actually see a face. Mm -hmm. And then the other family member might say, hey, okay, there's more going on there than I even realized. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a sad situation, but it's, it's true. It's usually, it usually boils down to one person. It does, yeah. And, and the honest truth is this is not a one-person job. Oh. It might be in the beginning. But it's not very, that doesn't last long. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be a one-person job. Uh, and it shouldn't be. A lot of people feel that way. Um, that while they need help and want help, because it's so 
it, it's complex, right? So there's so many resources out there, but when you're in the thick of it, you're not going for those resources until you're in some sort of situation. Like an elevated situation has gotten too uh, difficult to handle on your own. Now you're going to find resources um, to handle it. Whereas these resources are always here and can be utilized. It's just knowing that ahead of time. It was one of the worst mistakes I made caring for dad. It was me, it was my pride. My dad, my family, my responsibility, I got this. Right. I was wrong. Yeah. I was really wrong on this one. I mean, uh, by the time I was looking for help, I realized how much trouble I was in. I couldn't even take a breath. Right. The, his doctor was trying to tell me, for a year and a half, that doctor was trying to tell me, Gary, you need to call hospice. Let me call hospice for you. Like, my dad's not ready. Yeah. It wasn't my dad that wasn't ready. It was me. Yeah. I finally get to the point, I'm like, okay, call hospice. Make the call. They show up that afternoon. They assess my dad. I get medication coming to the house. They're bathing him twice, three times a week. I'm like, I turned this down for a year and a half. Yeah. I get a doctor coming to my house. Yeah. Right? It's incredible, right? But Don't, you, you got to find out what's available to you, and you got to take all the help you can get. Yeah. Because I, I think from the, the long-term care side of things, um, what we see a lot is the guilt that family caregivers have. And the guilt yeah. of having to go into a nursing home, um, the guilt of n not being able to provide the care that their loved one needs. And I think what I kind of work to promote is that no, finding that support is going to allow you to have a relationship with your loved one that is, is what they need the most at this time. They need you as their son, their daughter, their you know friend or, they don't need you as a, a medical caregiver. I mean, they, they do. They, they feel like they've given up on this person, and now they feel like they left them with strangers. I mean, yeah. it's a very tough trigger to pull to put somebody in a facility on this illness. Yeah. I got a woman on the East Coast. She goes sees her husband every day. He only lives two miles from the house. And she tells me every day when she leaves, she's bawling her eyes out in that parking lot. Yeah. And he's been there for over two years. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's, this is tearing this woman apart on it. I mean, he's in a good facility. I know exactly where the man's at, but I mean, it, it's, so that's when I tell the staff, right, when I'm on training this building, you have to keep an eye on everybody in this building. Yeah. Not just your residents, man. Please keep an eye on the families. Yeah. You know, they, you know, you might be calling the ambulance and it might not be for a resident. I mean, it's going to be, you know. Yeah. Um, and the family caregivers are the ones that if they feel if you work to help them feel secure in the care that your loved one is receiving, but also that, that they're needed there, that their input is welcomed, that they're not, you know, trying to overstep some sort of boundary with professional care. As, as their caregiver, you still have a job. Your job is to make yeah. sure everybody else is doing their job. Right. Got it. So, so right. it's important you're there. So. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. Um, so I know we, we've, we've talked a lot of, uh, about a lot. You had mentioned um, in Florida, you're in Florida, that there are, while you're working in the facilities and you're working in the hospitals, you took on a new project, right? Um, for for the, yeah. You're talking about the shelters, yeah. Um, for the Florida Health Department, I am now training uh, their special needs shelters for hurricane shelters. Yeah. Our season starts next week. We're in Memorial Day this weekend. Uh, June 1st is the beginning of hurricane season. Right. Um, we changed the laws in this state in 2015 that now if you have Alzheimer's and dementia, you can go to the special needs shelter. Before that, they weren't really considering a disability. The state came around to that, but they weren't bringing the education into the shelters. After Irma came through us last year and beat us up, uh, they, they, they saw a new light on this. It was a mess. I mean, they, as I thought the state did a very good job. But I mean, it was it was tough. I mean, we had we we're evacuating both. We evacuated all nursing home facilities almost on both coasts. Wow. You're talking. I mean, you're talking probably a million residents out of these facilities. Jeez. I mean, it, it was intense on that deal. And some of these facilities didn't have power for weeks, so you couldn't even just bring them back home after the storm. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm going around. I'm training. Uh, I'm starting on the East Coast. So I'm going back Tuesday, doing my second class on this. We're teaching big classes. These are like 130 people in the class. I'm dealing it and dealing it. So it's basically, if you have a regular shelter, it's all volunteers. Right. But if it's a special needs shelter, the health department has to staff those shelters. 
Okay. That's how the state works. So I'm doing this for the special need on it. But we got to get people to pre-register for these shelters because that's how they're man manning them. Yeah. So that happened last year. We had all people that were pre-registered, and we had half the people showed up to these special needs shelters that were not registered, and they were completely understaffed. Is there a place it doesn't matter if you're in Florida or if you're in North Carolina or you're in Baltimore. You've got a season coming up right now, a storm season. You need to get pre-registered for your special needs shelters. That's that's a point I just want to make out to all your viewers. Yeah, and how do they pre-register? I would Google. You can just Google your county and special needs shelters, and you get the forms will probably pop right online. Oh wow! Okay. It's usually a PDF form you can download on it, or you can do it right online. You can register all the stuff right online. Mm -hmm. and you just put, you know, whether you need oxygen, I mean, whatever it is on it. I mean, this is a mess. I mean, when this comes down to this point on it. Yeah, definitely. I had facilities here. Some of them were busing their residents. Here's a problem. You got a, you got to win this company. They, they might own five or six buildings, five, five or six different residences. So, nursing home, assisted living, they have all these buildings. They don't want to move them to a building over here that's not in their company because they're afraid that, first of all, if their building gets destroyed, they're never going to get their residents back. And they put them in another company, they might not get them back either on it. So they're going to move them all the way to another one of their buildings. Well, that other building might be six, seven, eight hours away. So you're putting all these people on a bus, right at a pre-storm, half time at night. Yeah. <laughs> it was intense on this on it. Yeah. And if you're in an evacuation zone, you had to go. Yeah. You can't leave those people in a facility like that. Yeah. You know, if you're, if you're a homeowner, you want to take your chance on your own life. That's your, your thing. But you're in a facility, you're going. They're, they're going to they're gonna evacuate you. Yeah. And, I mean, it, uh, well, yeah, that raises a whole bunch of issues, especially when you're talking about individuals living with dementia yeah. that are looking to the caregivers. That, I mean, they're listening to tone. They're looking at faces. They're, yeah. So if you have... The, and, and you cannot pick another room that has more anxiety in it than a, a storm shelter. Right. Everybody so, sitting in that room is wondering if they have a house to go home to when they leave. Right. Where so the anxiety is through the, through the ceiling and the people with dementia. So we're asking them, this is what we're telling them, you have to have a quiet zone for them. Mm -hmm. We're teaching them redirection. We're teaching them all this stuff on it. I mean, that's what I've been doing on it. But you're going to have some patients where you're going to have to pull them out of that crowd. Yeah. Or it's all going to melt down on you. Yeah. And, and what are you going to do with them in the middle of the storm? You can't move them. I mean, you, they're there. Exactly. So exactly. It's, a very, it's a very important project. I'm happy to be doing it. Uh, it's going to be a lot of running. It's going to be a lot of driving. I'm going to be all over the state doing the stuff on it, but that's uh, that's all right. It's all right. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, we'll definitely put that information down below because Thank it's you. Make it as accessible to people as possible because that's a really great. Yeah, yeah pre-register for the special needs, man. Yeah. Yes. Um, now you said it is staffed, but can volunteers work there as well? Yeah, I'm going to tell you what happens here during the storms. So all the other shelters are volunteer based, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to get all the volunteers you think you're going to get in because they're worried about their own house. Oh, okay. Right. So, so even the regular shelters, they were very limited on staff that they had and then volunteer staff on it because a lot of these people, man, they were still boarding up their house. I mean, it was, you know. Right. So. Oh, yeah. But the state, yeah, you they're mandatory. If you work for this health department, you're, you're going into that. You know, they have certain people that are scheduled for these special needs shelters. Those are the staff members that I'm training right now on it. Uh, that's their job. They, they need to be there on this case on it. Yeah, Doesn't mean they're all going to show up either. <laughs> but, I mean, but you, you probably plan on 80, 90% yeah. of them, I'd say. So. That's good. You, I, just in talking with you, you can definitely tell that you have a passion for what you do. You love this field. I, I think it really comes down to just awareness being the driving force of the quality of life for individuals living with dementia. Um, can you kind of share that message with others? So, uh, why do you think people should enter this field? Um, if you spend time with these people, you realize there's so much good going on and all this on it. Yeah. I started a group called DementiaMentors.org on it and found it were all only for people living with dementia. These people are absolutely amazing. We got 120 members wow. right now, and I'm all over the globe: UK, Europe. I mean, we got Canada. I mean, I mean, we're I mean, we do 26 virtual memory cafes a month. Wow. Right now on it, on this, on it. And I mean, and these people have become family. Yeah. I have learned there's not a university on this planet that can teach me what those people have taught me mm. about all the Louis bars, the front up below, the best. I mean, they're giving me the information straight out. I'm telling you, we have to learn from these people. 
Yeah. Right. I mean, there, there isn't a university that can teach you what these people have taught on it. So, mm -hmm. uh, DementiaMentors.org, go watch the videos. We have over 100 videos, all done by people living with dementia, uh, talking about their own symptoms. Wow. And they're all like two, three minute short videos. Very short. Wow. You know, one of them talking about, for example, we had a guy from Indonesia, Barry. He goes, Barry rides in the back seat of the car. Yeah. <laughs> He's telling why. He goes, I cannot be in the passenger side without the driver going near to a curve. And I want to grab that wheel. Right. <laughs> so he goes, I'm fine in the back. You know, it's just, but this is coming right out of their, I don't want to say the horse's mouth, but right out of the patient's, you know, point yeah. of view. Uh, well, yeah. Then they talk about bathing. They're talking about, I mean, it's amazing what these people sit down and will tell you on these short videos. That's incredible. So um, all caregivers should be watching these videos. I really believe that on yeah, that's that's incredible and that's really empowering. And I, I actually I haven't heard that model before. Um, yeah. So they they are the true experts. Yeah, well, yeah, and and to hear them now while they're still able to communicate that is yeah. so incredible. Not that everyone wouldn't be able to later, but when you when you start talking about skilled nursing and, and end of life care and um, some of the most critical aspects of caregiving, um, particularly for this population, to know that ahead of time, preferences and approaches, and um, you know that they're that they're a person um, is is really encouraging to hear. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's good to caregiving. It's, yeah. it's, it's not everybody can do it. It takes a special type of person, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But I've met some of the best people in my life in this in this industry, and uh, the caregivers, man, are they're amazing. All you know, these people, they're, they're they're good people. Yeah, I, and I'll meet more tomorrow. That's yeah. No, Every day. It's right. It's growing. I mean, there's something. I don't know if you've experienced this, but I'll be at a social function, and it's almost gravitational those that have worked with um it, it might not even be professional caregivers but they've known somebody the conversation just kind of naturally comes to uh the experience and the emotions and the um and i'll, I'll have to say this because in hindsight i've found that more caregivers talk about the wonderful moments that they've had then they do the stressed out the i mean that's there they talk about the stress but they also talk about the um the, the special moments that they've had with their loved one i believe there's a brother and sisterhood between caregivers yeah yeah they really just you just walk into a support group it's all caregivers man and you just you can see there's a bond automatically on it so yeah amazing people Definitely, definitely. Uh, well, thank you so much for all of this excellent. Um, thank you for having me. This is great. Yeah, I think this is really um, needs to be heard, um, not only by professionals but also just everyone. <laughs> this is something that's affecting everybody. So the more you can learn, the better off we're all going to be. I mean, exactly. That's it. It's truly about education on this. It really, yeah, I agree. And you've offered some great resources that I'll, I'll definitely be uh, linking down below for people. Um, but then also I'll be linking to your website so people can find you.